Kathy, you can start the recording. Thank you. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Debbie Schnorr, and I'll be your presenter today. Welcome to the San Bernardino County Master Gardener composting class. And I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm the environmental education coordinator for the University of California Cooperative Extension of San Bernardino County. And I completed my master gardener training in March of 2021. I live in Rancho Cucamonga, where I'm a member of the Route 66 Community Garden. And I've been working on several school and community garden composting projects over the past few years. And we'd like to know where you're joining from. If you'd like to share, type your city in the chat. And Maggie, Maggie O'Neill is here in the background as my co-host, and she's going to be checking the chat and posting some links in there for us. And I just wanted to let you know that this talk uh, focuses on the hot composting method, and we'll also touch briefly on vermicomposting or worm composting. So I'm going to turn my video off right now to save some bandwidth and move on to the next slide. All right, let's start with a few housekeeping items. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and I will stop to answer questions at several points during the presentation. Uh, and if you have a question, you can either type it in the chat or unmute yourself to ask the question live. Uh, please turn off your video to save bandwidth and mute yourself if you're not speaking to minimize background noise. And if you want a PDF copy of the presentation slides or a link to the video, you can go to uh, recent presentations on the left-hand menu of our website, uh, mgsb.ucanr.edu. And those, if they're not posted already, will be uh, posted shortly and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel as well. And that's um, UCCE San Bernardino. Uh, we'll be putting some links in the chat and you can save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of the chat window and selecting save chat. So a little bit about San Bernardino County Master Gardeners. Uh, we are part of the University of California Cooperative Extension and Master Gardeners are trained volunteers uh, educating the public by sharing peer reviewed research and evidence based research from universities like the University of California. And we present presentations and do demonstrations on a wide variety of topics, including composting, sustainable landscaping, and seed saving. And this slide shows the UCCE programs in San Bernardino County. Um, some of them you may have heard of before uh, FNEP, the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program. 4-H uh, Youth Development Program, Master Gardeners, Master Food Preservers, and Academic advi ad Advisors in areas like natural resources and horticulture. And if you want to learn more about UCCE San Bernardino, you can visit our website, uh, cesanbernardino.ucanr.edu. And we also have a San Bernardino Regional Seed Library um, that shares seeds with the public. Uh, there are two locations, one in Montclair at the Chino Basin Water Conservation District and one in Yucaipa. Um, those locations are currently closed due to COVID, uh, but we're working to uh, reopen those. Um, we're still presenting our monthly seed saving classes online. You can sign up on the website where you registered for this class. And the next class is wrapping up your cool season veggie garden and harvesting its seeds. And that's on April 21st. So before I begin the composting presentation, I wanna quickly share some uh, public service announcements about three important issues in Southern California. I'll make this quick. 
Uh, the first is citrus greening disease, also known as HLB or Huang Long Bing. And it's a bacterial disease that's fatal to citrus, but harmless to people. And you can uh, help prevent the spread of this disease uh, taking a few simple actions. And HLB is spread by the Asian citrus psyllid or ACP, which is the insect that carries the bacteria. And so the photos um, on the left show the adult ACP. Um, it has wings, it's about the size of an aphid. It's uh, difficult to see with the naked eye. Um, all citrus varieties are susceptible to this disease. Uh, there's no treatment yet. Uh, and an infected tree will usually die within 10 years and the fruit uh, starts turning green and is not edible. And that's shown in the pictures on the right. And then the leaves have a blotchy yellow green color. However, you know, that, that blotchy uh, color can also be due to um, nutritional deficiencies and other diseases. So it's best to uh, look for the uh, ACP on the affected trees. So to prevent spread of the disease, um, here are the steps that you can take. Don't share stems and leaves when sharing citrus. If you're growing citrus on your property or taking it from someone else's property, uh, wipe off or gently wash the fruit before sharing or moving it. Um, and you don't need soap, just cold water. Don't share cuttings from citrus trees and keep ants out of your trees because ants will protect the ACP nymphs uh, for the sugary honeydew that they produce. And if you wanna know more, there's a whole section um, on the UCANR website uh, devoted to the ACP. And there's also a cell phone app that shows you how close your home is to uh, detected cases of HLB. The second issue I want to tell you about is the black fig fly. It's a relatively new pest to Southern California. It's been um, reported in multiple counties, Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles, Orange counties. It's native to the uh, Mediterranean and Middle East. And the females lay their, egg in the their eggs in the fig fruits and the larvae feed on the fruit. So it's obvious when you cut open the fruit. Um, this could have a significant impact on commercial fig produ production in California. So if you do see uh, the black fig fly, contact your county agricultural commissioner uh, to have your fruit tested and get advice on treatment. And then the third and last issue is the Mediterranean fruit fly, also known as the med fly. And it's been detected in areas around Upland uh, also a major threat to California agriculture. Um, if you live in the quarantine area, it's best to keep your raw fruits and vegetables on your property and at the very least keep them within the quarantine area. And if you want more information, you can check out the California Department of Food and Agriculture website. All right, let's uh, return to our presentation on composting. So here are the topics for today's workshop. We're going to start with the definition. Um, can't really talk about composting unless we know what it is. And then I really want to focus on the why. Why is composting important? Uh, next is the impact of Senate Bill 1383, which just went into effect in January. Um, and affects um, how California is going to um, dispose of organic waste. Uh, then we'll discuss the composting process, how it works, uh, what do you do, compost readiness and use, how do you tell when it's done, composting systems and tools, and then I'll give a short uh, introduction to vermicomposting, talk about project planning, and I want to leave you with a call to action and some concrete steps you can take to promote sustainability in your community. So Maggie, what, did anybody um, type in the chat where they uh, were joining from? Yeah, we have Highland, another person from Claremont, um, Redlands, Grand Terrace, Ukaipa, Chino Hills, so all around the valley. Wonderful. 
So um, I want to tailor this uh, presentation to your needs. So I'm going to ask uh, two more questions. Uh, if you want to participate, uh, type your answer in the chat. This is just going to be an informal poll. So the first question is, how much composting experience do you have? Um, none, you want to learn. A beginner, you're just starting out. Intermediate, you've been doing it for a year or more. And advanced, uh, you're doing it at a larger scale, say in a school or community garden or at the industrial scale. So type your answer in the chat and I'll wait uh, probably about 20 seconds <laughs> to continue on. We and have, a, we have uh, one more person from Victorville who's joining us. And then we have um, some people with not that much experience, a few beginners, um, some intermediate. So it looks like we've got a little bit of everything. Okay, perfect. And then uh, question number two, where are you interested in composting? Home, school, community, or another location? And if you have another location, uh, please uh, let us know and type your answer in the chat. So I'll wait a few seconds for some answers to come in. So far, definitely everyone is interested in home composting, backyard composting, uh, small spaces at home. So it looks like. OK. Um, yep. OK, great. And I just want to remind everybody, schools are great. Schools, especially the ones with gardens, are great places to start composting because you can use that compost right in the garden. So just another thing to keep in mind, also community gardens. All right, so let's get started. Uh, what is composting? Well, composting uses the natural process of decomposition and decay uh, to turn organic waste into a dark, crumbly, nutrient-rich material called compost. And um, by organic waste, I mean anything that was once alive that might otherwise go into the trash. And so that includes uh, grass clippings, food scraps, leaves, uh, and we'll go into more detail in a little bit. And you can see that compost, it looks very much like rich soil. And the next question is, why is composting important? And before I reveal the answers, I'd like to hear from you. Um, if you have any ideas, uh, put them in the chat and Maggie will uh, read them out as they come in. And people could unmute themselves to uh, reduce landfill waste, avoid methane, methane in landfills um, are two comments. And if anybody wants to unmute themselves, they could do that too. To improve my soil is another response. Great ideas. Saves money from buying topsoils um, and fertilizer. Absolutely. Great. Sounds like everybody is uh, well informed. So yeah, the first one and probably the most important is reducing landfill waste and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and most of that being methane, and that contributes to global warming. Uh, the second reason is it decreases the need for chemical fertilizer. And uh, compost is not a complete fertilizer, but it does provide some nutrients to the soil. And the more compost you, <laughs> you use, the less chemical fertilizers. And the less chemicals uh, put in the soil, um, the less there is a runoff into the water systems. So it improves water quality, uh, can improve soil structure and properties when used as a soil amendment. So we call it more of an amendment than a fertilizer. Uh, prevents weeds when used as a mulch and you can use um, compost, especially coarse compost as a mulch on top of the soil. And then when done on a larger scale, it can promote community engagement and an empowerment and you know, complete that uh, cycle of composting. So here's the closed uh, loop of community composting. And this is a uh, diagram from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and shows why composting locally is uh, beneficial. So if we start at the top here, 
um, community farms and gardens are um, producing fruits and vegetables. Um, and then it goes to say a farmer's market or a farm stand where the local produce is sold. That goes into meals and from the meals we get food scraps and then there can be collection within the community. And then that goes back into the composting system of the community farms and gardens, which make more produce. So um, it also, um, so it decreases waste and also uh, the need for long distance transportation. So that's why it's uh, so important on a, on a larger scale. And composting is also becoming more important than ever because of Senate Bill 1383. And if you haven't heard about it yet, uh, you probably will soon. And I want to acknowledge Cal Recycle per, um, for providing this slide in the next for public presentation. Um, I think all of us have seen how climate change is negatively impacting California. We have rising sea levels, reduced snowpack, um, wildfires that now uh, happen throughout the year, uh, severe drought, we've had several years of that, uh, heat waves. And one of the major contributors to climate change is methane gas, which has a much greater warming effect in the short term than carbon dioxide. So when organic waste is disposed in landfills, it releases large amounts of methane gas as it decomposes. So to address this issue, um, Senate Bill 1383 was adopted way back in 2016 to reduce organic waste in landfills and therefore reduce um, global warming gases such as methane. And what this means at a practical level is that organic waste can no longer be freely thrown into landfills. So cities, counties, district, districts will need to provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. So you may see a change in your um, trash collection uh, in the near future. So this is a timeline of the SB 1383 requirements. As I mentioned, the regulations took effect in January 1st of this year. However, they will not really be enforced until uh, 2024, about two years from now. Um, cities and counties are still figuring out how they're gonna comply with the regulations. So the law requires California to reduce landfilled organic waste by 75% by 2025, and that's compared to 2014 levels. Uh, and it also requires a 20% increase in edible food recovery by 2025, and that will provide food uh, to people in need. So each year, more than 6 million tons of food is being thrown into California landfills that could actually be consumed by people. So if you're interested in learning more about S SB 1383, uh, the Cal Recycle website has a wealth of information on the regulations, waste collection and recycling, food recovery, education outreach, um, and more. Um, but before we dive deeper into composting, are there any questions on SB 1383 and the benefits of composting? So far, nothing in the chat, but if anybody wants to type a question in the chat, or you can also unmute yourselves to ask a question and we can give people just a second to type. Right, let's see, somebody, Janet, you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself? So I have a question that um, composting reduces methane gas, but do we produce the same amount of methane gas if we do it in our backyard versus it's done in the landfill? Because it seems like it's the same materials. Whether yeah, we... it's, it's just um, decomposing in a different way. So actually, you know, all those uh, byproducts are going back into the soil when we compost rather than kind of uh, when it goes into landfills, it's not really decomposing properly. It's just sitting there forever. 
So it doesn't, it doesn't have the right conditions. It doesn't have the decomposers like the worms uh, in there to help it decompose. It doesn't have the water. It doesn't have the air. And then George asked a question, um, and Janet, maybe you had a follow-up, um, but George asks, is it aerobic or anaerobic in the landfill? It must be an anaerobic Right, it's more, more of, a, of an anaerobic environment because it's just covered with so many other things. So, you know, pretty much once, once that material is in the landfill, um, it's going to take, you know, if it ever breaks down, it would take a really, really, really long time. But if we, you know, if we work to um, make sure that it decomposes quickly and we put it back into the soil, then we're putting that, we're putting the carbon back into the soil rather than releasing it into the air. Carbon and nitrogen. Okay, I don't see anything else for now. That was a great question. Great yeah, question. that's a really good question. So now I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the composting process, um, just enough to whet your appetite. There's so much to learn, so many different kinds of composting. Um, we're gonna talk mainly about hot, hot composting, and this is just one of the most common methods, but there are many other ways to, to do it. Um, so the basic ingredients of composting are organic materials. Uh, sometimes you'll hear them referred to as feedstocks water and air, which contains oxygen. And as I mentioned before, organic materials are anything that was once alive. So by managing these ingredients and the temperature, uh, you can speed up the otherwise slow decomposition process. And there are two main types of organic materials used in compost, uh, browns and greens. And the browns are materials rich in carbon, like wood chips, sawdust, dry leaves, straw, plant stalks and twigs, uh, shredded newspaper, um, also uh, cardboard, so paper and, paper and cardboard. And then the greens are nitrogen rich materials such as uh, raw vegetable and fruit scraps, coffee grounds, crushed eggshells, cut flowers, grass clippings, all kinds of um, garden trimmings. And uh, note that not all these materials are green. Uh, coffee grounds are brown, but are considered greens because of the high nitrogen content. So what are the roles of the browns and greens in the compost pile? Well, the browns decay very slowly. Um, and they're also coarse browns can help keep the pile aerated. So they're really important. Uh, they tend to accumulate in the fall um, when plants die and, and leaves fall. Um, they tie up nitrogen in the soil if they're not fully composted. So it's important to uh, not use your compost too soon. And in the fall and winter, you may have more browns than greens. So you may need to wait to uh, use them. Uh, in contrast, uh, greens decay rapidly. Um, they may eventually, you know, if, if left, uh, left alone, they uh, eventually turn into browns. Uh, because they decay more rapidly and tend to be less bulky, they can cause odor problems. So that's why it's important to uh, add, add the browns to increase the aeration and decrease the odor. Uh, they accumulate more in the spring and summer when uh, plants are growing. And as I mentioned, they supply uh, nitrogen for composting. So the organic material doesn't decompose on its own. It needs help from uh, microorganisms, also called microbes and macroorganisms. And the microorganisms are bacteria and fungi. Uh, they break down the organic material. And as they do that, they heat up the compost pile. The macroorganisms are the creepy crawlies, such as snails, earthworms, flies, beetles, grubs, um, and they shred the materials into smaller pieces for the microbes, and they also feed on the microbes. So um, even though, you know, we normally consider a lot of these uh, creatures pests, um, they're good to have in our compost. That means our compost is, is healthy. 
So there are many different kinds of commercially available additives and starters, but you don't need them if you have your own greens and browns. Um, if you need more material, you can ask your favorite coffee shop, juice bar, or brewery for their waste. Uh, most Starbucks will save coffee grounds for gardeners. Um, also, uh, you can get um, free mulch to use uh, as browns for your pile. Usually you can get that from your city or a place like Chino, Chino Basin. So um, materials to avoid, to avoid, this is a, can be a controversial topic. Uh, this is a generic list and it really depends on a number of factors such as the composting method that you use, how much heat you're generating in your composting, where your operation is located, et cetera. Um, you definitely don't want to compost recyclables like plastic, metal, or glass. So recyclable is not the same as compostable. Those, those um, materials do not break down. Um, you also don't want to compost anything that contains toxic chemicals like treated or painted wood, um, anything that's diseased, uh, diseased or poisonous plants. So when you're starting out or if your pile isn't getting very hot or you're doing pole composting, uh, you may want to avoid aggressive weeds and grass seeds because that will grow uh, within your compost. Um, you also may want to um, avoid uh, meat and bones, cheese and dairy, cooked food, animal manure, um, do some experimentation and see what works for you. Um, a good rule of thumb is to not put anything in your compost pile that you wouldn't want in your garden. But I just want to um, let you know that, you know, there are a lot of uh, community composting sites that are, they will compost everything because they have very large piles and they can get them really hot. Also, like a company like Vertec, uh, when they're doing their industrial composting, they get that up to very, very high temperatures, so they can pretty much take all organic material. I mean, there's a quick question, and you kind of addressed it, but I thought I should still ask it. Okay. Um, it says, I compost my pine shavings with chicken manure. Is that risky? Um, and I'll let you take that, yeah. Um, I would say it really depends, you know, like there's nothing wrong with putting, um, unless you have some moral issues about using animal products in your garden. Um, chicken manure is certainly um, a good uh, thing to put in your beds. Um, pine uh, probably breaks down pretty slowly, but you know, those, if it works for you and it's composting well and it's not smelling um, and it works well in your garden, I would say those are, those are fine to use. I know people that use like um, rabbit litter as well, but I think you probably don't, um, if you're going to uh, use something, you probably want to use the manure of an herbivore just to avoid any kind of um, bad uh, bacteria. Any and other questions? I, would just, I, I don't see anything else in there. And then I would just add, you know, if you're doing leafy vegetables or root vegetables, um, just sort of consider what you use that compost in and be mindful of that. But I don't see anything else in the chat yet. So we're good to yep. go. Yep. All right. Um, so there are two main types of composting, cold and hot, um, and unless you have a lot of time on your hands, uh, we recommend hot composting. Um, passive or cold, cold composting is basically set it uh, and forget it, so you don't really have to do much management of your compost pile, just pile it up. Uh, materials are going to break down slowly. Um, as I mentioned before, the weed seeds and the pathogens may survive because um, you're not getting it up to a high temperature to kill them. Uh, and it does take a long time to finish compost. So it could be a year or more, but you know, it's certainly something, um, something that you can do um, if you're willing to do a little bit more work for um, some benefit, uh, you can do active or hot composting. And there um, you've got to manage, uh, manage the pile to optimize the conditions. You want to get your temperatures 
over 104. That's a definition of um, hot composting and um, really to kill off those weed seeds and pathogens up to 140, 150, 100, you know, up to about 160 degrees max. And then uh, it will be a much shorter time to finish compost. So more like months instead of years. Yeah. And in hot composting, the pile goes through several temperature phases. So this chart shows temperature versus time. And so in the first phase, the first phase is ca called mesophilic. And that's this thin slice at the very left here that doesn't have a, a name on it. Uh, the pile starts to warm up as the bacteria and fungi grow. And this usually takes uh, days. Then comes the active phase, uh, the thermophilic phase where the pile reaches its peak temperature and the microbes are breaking down the organic materials. And this can take anywhere from days, uh, day, I would say weeks to um, months. And then the next phase is the curing phase where uh, the pile cools down and the decomposition slows down and eventually stop. And it's a best to uh, allow the compost to cure at least a month or two. And for the pile to cure, you have to stop adding new material. Every time you add new material, you're going back into this active phase. So as you wait for your pile to cure, you may want to start a, a new pile. So some systems use multiple piles. One is where the material's added and then one that's cooking in the active phase, and then one that's curing, and then maybe another one that's ready, ready to use. So as I mentioned before, um, in hot composting, it's important to uh, manage the conditions in the pile. So in addition to monitoring that temperature, uh, you also want to turn your pile on a regular basis, and that exposes the materials to oxygen. It releases trapped heat, which uh, the, the pile can get pretty hot in the summer. It's going to distribute the moisture and the nutrients and the organisms around your pile to you know, fully break up the organic material. And then uh, also when you turn it, you're mechanically breaking up the materials. And generally, the more you turn the pile, the faster it will decompose. And um, th the most important time to give attention to the pile is when it's warming up, when it's hot. So, you know, maybe you turn it two to three times a week when the pile's hot, but if you don't have time or uh, resources to do that, um, it'll just go a little bit slower. And the best way I've found to turn the pile is with a five-tined pitchfork uh, shown, shown here. Uh, it's sometimes called a manure fork. Uh, if you have a big pile, a pitchfork works better to turn the material than a shovel, but you know, pretty much uh, use, use what you have. And then water, um, water is one of the key ingredients in compost. And so for fastest decomposition, you need to have the water content just right. If the pile's too dry, the decomposition is going to slow or stop. Those micros will start to uh, die or stop uh, decomposing. And then um, if the pile's too wet, the process may lack oxygen, it goes anaerobic and it's gonna to start to smell. So the ideal uh, moisture content for an active pile is about 40 to 65%. Um, and you wanna, you don't have to measure it directly. You can just keep the pile as moist as a wrung out sponge. And again, turning it is gonna do uh, distribute that water. Um, some other considerations are the size of the materials, the balance of browns and greens, and the size of the pile. So um, you want to chop the materials into as small pieces as possible, um, like half to one and a half inches in size. And then um, you can shred or grind the woody material and the leaves, but you do have to be a little careful there because then um, you might not have a 
enough bulk in your pile and uh, it will go anaerobic and get a little bit slimy. So just may, it's, it's good to have uh, wood chips or mulch in there, you know, to, um, to have a little bit uh, of aeration. And then uh, the balance of browns and greens. So the optimal carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, by weight is 30 to one. And that, you know, you can look up what each thing you put in your pile is as far as um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And then you can figure out uh, what your pile is or uh, the easier way to do it is just to estimate uh, with an equal volume of browns and greens. I personally like to use uh, two to three times more browns than greens um, just to uh, keep, keep uh, the odors down. And then um, you can always add more browns if the pile uh, starts to get too wet, starts to get smelly. And then um, use coarse browns as a base and cover layer, make it into a dome shape. And the base, um, a base of um, mulch will allow the pile to um, allow the water to drain through the bottom of the pile. And then the cover layer is gonna keep the wildlife from um, being attracted to your pile. And then the size of the pile to really um, get, uh, hot, get the uh, pile to be hot and do hot composting, it really needs to be optimally um, a certain size. So it's recommended it be at least three feet tall by three feet wide by three feet deep, about 27 cubic feet for hot composting. And maybe you don't have enough material or enough room in your yard for that. And that's okay. It just may not um, get as hot, but you want to try to get, um, get it uh, as big as you can or as close to that um, size as you can. And so when is the compost ready? Um, it'll be, as I said before, dark brown, crumbly, loose. It's gonna look like um, nice soil. Uh, it's gonna smell earthy, won't smell bad. Um, also, you wanna make sure that it contains no um, recognizable uh, input materials. So you shouldn't see any banana peels or apple cores or eggshells. You know, once it's ready, all that should be uh, broken down. It may not be quite as fine as what you see in this picture, but the longer you let it go, the finer it's going to be. And also the pile shrinks to about a third of its original size. So it, it's kind of nice for backyard composters. You can put hundreds of pounds of food into a pile and it really ends up quite small and manageable. And then there are two simple tests of readiness that you can do. Um, so the first one's the bag test. So you take a little bit of moist compost, uh, you put it in a Ziploc bag, keep it there for several days. And when you open up, there shouldn't be any foul odor um, and it shouldn't, shouldn't smell like ammonia, it should still smell fresh. Um, if, if it doesn't, then you can um, let your pile cure for, for a little bit longer. It means it's not quite ready. And then for germination tests, um, check to see if you can start some seeds in your compost. You just wanna make sure that your seeds are still viable and you can compare that with um, the germination um, in a commercial soil mix. So if your compost fails these tests, uh, you can try curing it longer or you can send it to a lab for analysis. And then finally, um, using finished compost, um, using it as a soil amendment is the best use. Um, as we discussed earlier, compost improves soil health. Um, although it's not, you know, it's not a complete fertilizer, uh, it does add nutrients. Um, so you just mix in about a two inch layer into the top four to six um, inches of soil. And then uh, for coarser compost, you can use that as a mulch and you spread it uh, one to four inch layer uh, around flowers, shrubs, trees, vegetables. Uh, just make sure to keep it away from tree trunks uh, to avoid uh, diseases. And then for potting mixes, um, you can add it to commercial or homemade potting mixes and that you would use more of a finer 
uh, compost so you can run it through a screen to remove the larger pieces. And then when you plant trees, uh, don't use compost or other soil amendments to fill in the hole because the roots may really like it there. They like all the nutrients, so they'll stay in the amended soil and may be, um, become circled as shown here, and that could eventually cause the tree to fall. So are there any, before we move on to the next part, are there any questions about the composting process itself? We're gonna move on to systems and tools uh, in the next couple of slides. Yeah, there was a couple of questions. Um, one was how to monitor the moisture content of a compost pile. And I think you kind of addressed that, but... Um... Yeah, that's just the squeeze, they call it the squeeze test. So you take your bare hand and you take a, a bunch of compost, in, a clump of compost in your bare hand. And uh, if you squeeze it, it should feel nice and moist. You might see like maybe one or two drops of water come out. And you know, if it's like really just wet and just dripping with water, that's too much. And if it's so dry that you know, it just kind of crumbles away in your hands, that's, uh, that's not enough. And that, that's pretty much, that's the easiest way to do it. And then um, another question was about, I'll go back to in just a second, but one was, will ambient temperature affect the rate of the active phase? Uh, yes, it does. In fact, um, definitely you are going to compost faster or what I've observed is you're composting much, much faster in the summer. Like at Route 66, I've seen the compost get up to 160 degrees in the summer um, and in the winter, like right now, um, it's only getting to maybe 120. And so it is definitely, it definitely goes a lot faster, it gets to that higher, it gets to higher temperatures, it goes faster uh, in the summer. But you can still, you know, people still do composting, even in cold places with snow over the winter, you know, it just takes longer. Great. And then another question was, um, or maybe a comment was that um, someone heard that uh, mushroom compost is alkaline. Should we throw mushrooms in the compost pile? Yeah, you know, I think it's really, and it's also like um, citrus is acidic. So it's just good to have a good um, variety of foods you're putting in there. So I would say, you know, all of it is good, but if it's, for instance, if it's all mushrooms, then it's gonna be alkaline. <laughs> and if it's all citrus, it's gonna be acidic. So just try to get a good, a good mix of things. And you can, um, you know, before you use your compost, you can test the pH using one of the kits that you get at the big box garden centers and see, and you know, if it's off, there are amendments you can put in to um, balance that out. Great, and then uh, eggshells okay, yeah? Eggshells are great, but just I would say, I would recommend um, really trying to crumble them into small pieces. Like if you put a whole, <laughs> a whole eggshell in there, it might stay there for quite a while, but yeah, just try to break everything up into pieces, but those are great. Very good. And I don't see anything else. If anybody has anything in the chat or wants to add anything um, to the chat or unmute yourselves. And then there was another question about your thoughts on tumblers, but you're going to talk about equipment in just a little bit. So I yes, think that's, and uh, I, my, my thoughts on tumblers are not too um, favorable. And this is just my, you know, my experience and what I've heard from others. Um, they do make it easier because then you don't have to have any tools to be able to move the compost around you just turn the handle however you know if you're going by the size rule most of them are not very big and so they really don't give you the volume to get up to very high temperatures so I would say you know in some backyard situations you know it, it's better it's better than nothing um, and it does keep the compost contained but I don't think you're gonna really get um, up to a high temperature in that hot composting um, active phase. So, you know, that's something you need to need to monitor. But I've, yeah, I guess I've known a lot of people that have not um, been super happy with the tumblers, but if your experience is different, I would love to hear. 
Yeah, definitely with the Master Gardener um, helpline and our Ask a Master Gardener time that we have the second Sunday of each month, then we get a lot of questions about people having trouble with tumbler compost. And another thing, in addition to what Debbie said, was that if you just have one tumbler and you're constantly feeding it, it's never ready. Um, but great comments, Debbie. So I don't see anything else in the chat. So I think we're good to go. All right. So let's talk about composting systems. So there are many different kinds out there. Um, you can start with just like a simple plastic bin that you can get at your um, big box garden centers. And, you know, with something like that, you just have to make sure that, um, you know, you have some way to aerate it and, you know, let the air in there. And also, you know, make sure that it is big enough to, um, to do the hot composting. And then um, wire bin is actually a really nice way to do it. Let's lots of air in, uh, keeps it contained. And again, if you're doing your composting correctly, you've got the correct balance of browns and greens. Um, you know, having it out in the open really should not be an issue. Um, you know, maybe unless you have some uh, wildlife that's getting in there in your backyard. And then um, there are wooden bins. And as, um, you know, Maggie was saying, and as, as I said earlier, you know, you've got your pile goes through several different phases. So you can actually have a wooden bin with several or some kind of bin with several compartments and you can move the compost from one compartment to the next as it matures, or you can have compost in um, several different stages of decomposition in the different compartments. So for instance, you could start out, you've got a, a pile that's warming up uh, on the left side. And then when it starts to go into that um, active phase, you put it in the middle and then start a new pile in that first bin. And then when it gets to um, the curing phase, then it goes into the last pile and you can either use it from there or move it outside your bin. Um, and then uh, on the lower left is an open pile. This is at um, uh, Huerta del Valle Community Garden, and it's really quite big. Uh, you need big equipment to be able to uh, turn that, but that's what a lot of um, a lot of community gardens or community composting um, sites will use. Uh, super easy, and again. Um, you, if you put the right things in there and the right um, balance of browns and greens, you should not have too much of an odor problem. And then the infamous tumbler is in the middle. Um, and um, just make sure when you're, when you're using your tumbler that you are adding water to it and that you do have the vents open to uh, get the air in there and that you are tumbling it on a, on a regular basis. And the bigger, I would say the bigger, the better. And then um, worm bins on the right-hand side, and we're gonna be going into uh, vermicomposting. And a lot of these have multiple uh, chambers in them. And then composting tools, these are mostly optional. Um, composting can be very economic very economical. Uh, all you really need is a tool such as a pitchfork or a shovel to build and turn your pile. Um, a composting thermometer um, can be helpful when you're starting out to make sure the pile's heating up properly. And the thing about a composting thermometer, um, it's got a really long stem so you can get deep into the pile. Um, and you can get those, you can get those on, on Amazon. Um, if the pile is heating up, uh, you can usually see steam rising even in the summer. So you don't have to have a thermometer, just, you know, just uh, feel it and watch the steam rise. Um, bigger operations may want to keep a log and a measure of the amount of um, organic material that's going into the pile with a scale to measure how much is being, um, being uh, kept from the landfill. And then loppers and shears can be useful for cutting yard waste, especially like stems um, into smaller pieces. And so I just wanted to show a few pictures of an example of community composting that I'm personally involved with at Route 66 Community Garden, and that's in uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Um, this project's being supported by community, a community composting for green spaces grant from Cal Recycle. 
And the goal is to turn um, some of the 14 acres of this property into an urban farm. So the picture at the top left is a composting team uh, weighing the organic material that's been collected from local businesses like Starbucks. Uh, the center, pic center top picture shows um, organic material being added to the compost piles. And uh, we're working with the city of Rancho Cucamonga to get weekly deliveries of mulch uh, from Burtec to cover the future farm area. And then um, on the bottom, the photo at the lower left is a public composting workshop talk, taught by master gardeners that was last summer. And the master gardeners also built a composting system for the garden members. And you can see two piles of compost there. Um, and in that, that system, those are really large bays. So the, each pile actually stays in its bay until it's ready to use and then gets moved out of the compost system. And then on the lower right, um, there is a tractor spreading the mulch and the compost uh, over, over the future farm area. So, you know, for larger scale composting, it does take some heavy equipment. So this type of composting is uh, truly a community effort. So before I go on to vermicomposting, and I'll try to get through that quickly, we only have seven minutes till the top of the hour. Um, are there any questions about hot composting? Um, so if anybody wants to type something in the chat or unmute, um, there was a comment um, that I thought I'd share was I have a large capacity double cylinder tumbler, um, not myself, but somebody in the chat yeah. and agree that the volume is becoming an issue. However, so far they do like it. And then there was another okay. question. Um, and so a, dis a question about this turning reduce the steam? Um, it will, uh, you know, let out some steam, um, which sometimes is good. Like for instance, you know, if the, if the temperature is getting up to about 160, that's going to start killing off some of the decomposers. So yeah, you don't want it to get too hot. Um, so yeah, it does release a little bit of the steam, but you know, the pile is still going, it's going to keep getting hot until it's, uh, until it's done decomposing. Okay, and so far I don't see anything else in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute. Uh, oh, let's see. Can uh, someone wants to know if they can use a Rubbermaid trash can. Um, with on wheels with holes drilled for aeration absolutely um, absolutely yep give it a give it a give it a go you might have to drill more holes depending on you know how it how it works but yeah you don't need anything fancy to do this yeah and i saw one place somebody had a trash can and they just turned it on its side and rolled it around <laughs> hey um, i don't know how effective that was but that was somebody's method mm -hmm. um, and then it Another question is, uh, what are decomposers? Okay, so we did cover that earlier, and it's it's mainly um, microbes and microorganisms and macroorganisms. So bacteria, fungi, and then the bigger bugs like beetles, flies, grubs, things like that. And that's what's going to decompose. That's what's going to eat your compost. And then um, is a cylinder tumbler faster than other methods is another question in the chat. Um, you know, it, it could be, I think that, you know, if you're turning, it's probably turning things, um, at least the way I turn things, it probably turns them more completely than I do with a pitchfork. Um, but it, it could be, and you do have a smaller amount in there as well. But, um, if you're doing it right, any method should uh, work within a couple of months. And I would say the least amount of time you would need to finish uh, till finished compost is like six to eight weeks. And the longer you can let it um, sit and cure, the better. See anything else in the chat? So I think you're good to go. Okay, four minutes. Okay, let's do, uh, we'll do, Quick, a quick intro to vermicomposting. 
So just like uh, other types of composting, there are numerous different kinds of bins that you can have um, in the upper right. You can make your own from some of these plastic storage bins and you just um, you just drill some holes in them. And then they have kind of like the, this is the Cadillac version on the, on the left with the, with the little spout coming. Uh, you can have uh, a, just a bucket with a little spout or no spout. Um, and you can put it in the ground. So uh, whatever, whatever works for you. There are many different ways to do it, but it really doesn't have to be very expensive. Um, the type of worm that's mostly used is the red worm. Uh, this one here, a red wiggler. And unlike earthworms, they're surface dwellers. Uh, they do well in the bin. However, people have told me they use earthworms. So again, whatever works for you. Um, red wigglers can be purchased online and at some uh, garden and farm supply stores. And there, and um, worms need moisture, air, darkness, and warm temperatures, but not too hot, which can really be an issue in the summer. Just make sure that you don't put your bin out in the sun um, because the, the um, worms will not be able to live through that. So you wanna make some bedding out of um, paper, like newspapers, um, dirt, leaves, put some water in there, make it nice and moist. And then you're gonna feed your worms and they like a lot of the same things that we would put into a traditional composting pile like fruit and vegetable scraps, paper, pasta that's uh, cooked, but uh, not with oil or sauce, bread, cereal, uh, coffee grounds, tea leaves, eggshells. Uh, the things that you want to avoid are lots of yard waste because that can start heating up the pile and kill the worms. You want to wash your fruit and vegetable before you uh, put it in your bin. Um, citrus is a little too acidic for the worms. And then you don't want to put any animal or dairy products or manure in a worm bin. And so keys to successful vermicomposting, uh, don't overfeed the worms, keep the bedding damp, not wet, avoid certain foods. Um, make sure that the foods are, um, the pieces of food are small, just like you would a regular compost pile. Um, rotate the food location in the bin to get the worms crawling throughout the bin. Um, cover the food with bedding. And key point, keep the worms cool, like 55 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So put, put those guys in the shade. And just remember that vermicomposting is animal husbandry. It's, you know, these are like your pets and you're, you wanna do things to keep them, keep them healthy. And then you know, the end products of vermicomposting, two things, one is the castings, which is essentially worm poop, uh, what comes out of the worm after they, di they digest it. And you can put those in your garden beds and then um, the liquid or tea, which also contains uh, some nutrients. But really it's those, um, the castings are, are, are really uh, what you would use as compost. Um, any questions about vermicomposting? Um, full disclosure, I have helped with vermicomposting, but I have not really started a vermicomposting bin myself or been responsible for the care and feeding of worms, so. There is a, a comment about how um, one of the participants, their uh, dad raised earthworms in the 70s as a protein of the future. And they even put out a book, The Worm Has Turned to Peat Moss. <laughs> so <laughs> that is good to know. Um, I we haven't love gotten that, that way, but. Um, uh, and then yeah. a question. And then a question about cooked food. If if I only boil veggies for broth without any seasoning, are those veggies still compostable? I think so. Yeah, I mean, you just don't want to have a lot of um, a lot of oil and grease in there, but I would say sure. And I would, and that would be for both vermicomposting and uh, non-worm composting. Um, let's see, what does it say? Uh, it doesn't really say. I would say yes. Um, you know, as long as you don't have lots of other stuff in there, seasonings and oil and those kind of things. Again, it's, it's kind of trial and error to see what works for you. You know, maybe, maybe with the worms, you might want to stick with more of the raw fruit and veggie scraps. You just want to make sure that things aren't rotting 
in your in your worm bin. Very good. Okay, I don't see anything else in the chat. If anybody else wants to type anything, um, otherwise or unmute, then otherwise, I think we're good. Okay, so um, we it is 101 right now. So I'm going to quickly finish this up. Um, this just shows steps to start composting, and it is relevant to both uh, backyard composting and composting on a on a bigger scale. Um, just to set your goals, like for instance, you would like to compost all your food waste so that you can um, so that you can uh, put it your compost in your um, backyard garden, uh, form your team, which might just be you or you and your family, uh, develop a plan, select your site, and you know that's always important where you where you're going to put it. Um, which system are you going to use? What tools, if any, are you going to use? Um, and then it also takes some forethought in collecting and managing your materials. So where are you going to, for instance, it's a good idea to have a pile of browns there uh, to mix with your greens as you take them out of the kitchen. So you might want to have uh, a bag or a pile of um, mulch too, and then managing your process and, and site. And so it really is kind of like a science project. And you want to you want to actively um, check it to make sure that it's composting properly. And then, if you're interested in composting in a larger scale, the city of Sydney, Australia, has a nice um, website on how or a nice document on how to write a community composting management plan and has a lot of um, questions uh, just to get you thinking about everything you need. Um, you know, why are you doing it? Um, where are you going to put your composting system? Do you have access to water? Do you have access to tools? And so finally, I want to end with a call to action. Um, and first of all, um, stay informed with uh, what's going on with um, organic waste disposal in your area. So ask your city, ask your school, what are they doing? What are their plans for organic waste collection and recycling? Um, at this point, you might get a lot of blank stares if you ask people, but I think as long as they know that somebody's interested and somebody cares, you know, that's going to spur the process along. Um, spread the word, share what you've learned about the benefits of composting with your community. Uh, get involved, start or join a local composting or recycling project. Um, a lot of times uh, schools are doing composting, community gardens are doing composting, there are community sites. Um, keep it local, um, make and use compost locally to reduce those uh, transportation. Um, check with your city for free compost and mulch. With uh, SB 1385, that requires the city to use their recycled materials locally. So there might be more um, Avail more free resources available. And then save food. So support edible food recovery programs, uh, donate your excess garden produce. I think the infrastructure that's being built up with SB 1383 will make this a lot easier to do uh, than it's been in the past. And then, you know, also eat what you buy uh, and try to generate less waste. And so we've got a couple of pages of resources. We also have a resource sheet that's on our website. So you can check there. And I think Maggie can put these in the chat and then check our uh, website for classes and um, more information, mgsb.ucanr.edu. And you can follow us on social media, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And um, just be aware that uh, we're trying to put as many presentations um, from our online uh, presentations as possible on the UCCE San Bernardino YouTube channel. And then sign up for our newsletter uh, on our website. And if there's any final questions, I can take those. And if you think of any questions later, you can contact our Master Gardener Helpline or you can contact uh, me directly. So any final questions? Uh, there may be people typing in the chat or un, um, 
mute yourself if you'd like. Um, there was a question. Do we have a master composter program? Debbie, you want me to take that one or you want to? Um, yeah, maybe you can correct me, um, Maggie, but I, you know, during, they seem to have shut down a lot of those uh, during the, I, I haven't seen much during the pandemic. Um, do you know of anything that's currently running? Yeah, so the only thing I know is that when I was up initially, you know, it's not part of the UC Master Gardener program. Um, and it's a separate or it hasn't it was in the past, but it's a separate program now. But the only place that I know that it's active um, before the pandemic was up in the high desert. So and I think the person who asked that question is in the high desert. And so they do have a master composting program that they were running up until COVID. So I would just look around um, and they often attend events up at the local um, like high desert at the museum and at other places. So that's where I've seen them in the past is at those locations. So check that out. And if I find anything out about it, I can um, let you know, since I think I know the person who asked that question. Oh, and then another question, is there, no adding of sandy soil at all during the compost process. Um, it is not necessary. And um, yeah, I guess I would be interested to find out uh, what the purpose of adding the sandy soil would be. I mean, if you have a lot of clay soil, um, I could see the reason for adding it in there if you're going to add it back into your soil. Janet, if you want to, I think that was Janet's question. If you want to unmute yourself, feel free to or type more in the chat. Um, okay. I was just wondering, like, because in Loma Linda, our soil is pretty sandy. And if I composted it with the soil, then by the time I'm done, then it should be just regular, like, potting soil that I would be light and usable and nutritious for my plants. So I'm thinking if I add sandy soil while I'm composting it and then it'll be ready to go when it's done. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's an option. I would say most people would do that afterwards, you know, make the compost and then add it with the sandy soil and then use that product as your, as your soil. But, um, you know, the only issue I could see with doing it before is it's pretty heavy. So if you're trying, you know, depending on where you're putting it, if you're trying to turn it, it might get really heavy. And then um, it might, because the soil is so fine, um, it may um, hurt the aeration of the pile. But otherwise I don't, I can't imagine that it would hurt um, other than the, the aeration and the weight. And um, I think, you know, the worms would certainly like that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, I think, but if there's any other questions, um, feel free to ask. And thank you so much. Uh, Debbie, do you have anything else you want to add before I stop the recording? Yeah, the, uh, the only other thing I was going to add is, you know, one place that really has a lot of good resources on composting is the Solana Center. Uh, down in San Diego. So um, I have not made it down there myself, but I've heard it's a great place to visit. And um, I think they have a lot of um, information on their website. And I know that they do classes there as well. And I think also um, LA Compost um, offers some classes and they've got, um, they've got an area where they, um, you know, you can actually, um, uh, do some composting with them. They can show you how to compost. Is that the Solana Center for Environmental in in Innovation that I'll, I could drop yes, that in the chat? Yes. Okay, I'll drop that in the chat. Okay, and then one more. Um, do you do you throw the used potting mix into the compost pile? And I kind of think that's a similar question um to the other question but so use potting mix yeah um i would say again you know if it's not too much um it, it's fine and we we certainly do that at route 66 because it's what kind of like i view it as um i guess i view it as a uh, a brown 
There you go. And then what was the LA? What was it? LA compost? LA, LA compost. compost. Okay, I'll drop that in the chat. I have a lot of well. great re resources as well. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, LA thanks. compost. Um, also, they um, do not put any um, meat or dairy products or manure or anything in their compost. Um, and then another question, will hot compost kill powdery mildew in existing soil? I think, and Maggie may be better um, informed to, uh, to answer this question. I would think if it's getting up really high, it would. I don't know if, if powdery mildew can survive uh, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Plus, it's going to be really super dry. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I would say probably, um, you know, I, I would say that would be a helpline question for a further, uh, more in-depth answer. I think most things except for some viruses are killed by that temperature. But what I don't know with the mold is if it can sporulate. Yes. So that would be a good helpline question where we could specifically answer the powdery mildew since not all mildews are the same. Um, right. So good question. And I would also, um, if in doubt, leave it out. Yep. So like if you do have diseased plants and you're just working on backyard composting, I, I would not put them in. I would err on the side of caution. Very good. Okay. Well, great presentation, Debbie. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Thanks so much. I learned a Thank lot.